Now another thing I wanted to talk about in the context of quantization is power transfer. To illustrate what I mean by this, we're going to go back to the one bit case. So here I've drawn uh, two signals, again with time and voltage. And uh, as you can see, if we just call everything in the upper region a 1 and everything in the lower region a 0, so everything up here is a 1 and everything up here is a 0, then there, you really have no way to differentiate between these two signals. Um, and another way to say this is that for a range of power inputs, uh, we get the same power output. So here I'm going to draw a graph of the power transfer through a quantization step, uh, where the x-axis is the power I put in to the quantization step, and I'm going to graph the power I get out uh, as a ratio of the power I put in. So ideally, uh, an ideal uh, quantization would not change the power at each step, so that no matter what power I put in, I would always get the same power out. So that would be uh, a line at unity here. But as it turns out, uh, for a different number of bits that I use to quantize my signal, I'll get different power transfer uh, functions. So you can kind of see on the function at the left that it doesn't matter what power I put in. It's really just the amount, the number of crossings from 0 to 1 and back down again to 0 that determine uh, the uh, digitization of that signal and therefore determines the, the power output. And basically, that power output doesn't depend at all on power input. So we have a flat P out uh, versus increasing P in uh, means that the power transfer function for a one bit quantization is going to tend uh, to go down as we increase power input. Uh, and that's just saying that the a one bit quantizer doesn't uh, has the same P out versus P in. It doesn't capture very much of the amplitude of the signal. Now I should say before I go uh, and explore higher bits that we are going to have to say something about uh, what kind of a signal we're putting in here. Now I've chosen to put in uh, a sine wave just to illustrate the problem, but in fact a much more common uh, signal for radio astronomy applications uh, is noise. And, um, and in fact that's what we're going to do the rest of these uh, quantization uh, power transfer curves. Uh, assuming our, our noise. Um, and it turns out you, you can work out the power transfer for different quantization uh, analytically. Um, and it also is, uh, you can work them out numerically on your computer. So if we go to the 2-bit case, I'll add uh, some threshold lines to illustrate our four states here. You'll see, and, and this is a generic feature of all quantization curves, is that uh, up to a certain amplitude, they aren't actually toggling a level. So there's a, a minimum P in at which uh, that you have to get to in order to even get any power out uh, whatsoever. And then another generic feature of the quantization is that uh, once you get to that hurdle of activating the first state, uh, they generally tend to go towards a higher uh, power out than you put in. And the reason for that is that uh, w that uh, if you start rounding up your signal to the next level, you start getting more power out. Uh, you, you've, you've generally amplified your signal. Um, they then tend to fall off back towards unity um, and then uh, may drift slowly uh, versus power input. And eventually if you turn up your signal too high, they all kind of have to default back to the one bit case. That is, if you turn your, your signal so, so powerful that it's always going between the absolute maximum state of your quantizer and the absolute minimum state of your quantizer, it's as if you only had one bit. There are just two states of your quantizer. So all of these curves will eventually asymptote to the one bit case at high PNs. And then uh, the number of bits that there are just determines uh, the, the range here um, between where you activate uh, the quantization, so you start actually toggling bits, and where you start rolling off and, and asymptoting towards the, uh, the one bit case. And so this is the dynamic range of your quantizer. Now a nice thing is if you know your 
uh, signal characteristics. For example, if you know that you're putting in noise, you can actually characterize these curves and back them back out, uh, which is to say as long as you're operating in a realm here where for each power in, there's a unique power out. Um, this is an invertible function over this range. And so uh, if you keep your signals within this range, you can correct out this problem of, uh, of a non-unity power transfer through your quantization curve. And for the one-bit case, this was called the Van Vleck correction, uh, named after the, uh, the person who characterized it, Van Vleck. Um, and it generalizes to any number of bits. In practice, uh, we found that you know you definitely have to do this correction uh, in the one bit case. In in for example, about four bit case, uh, you know it's still necessary to do uh, this to to correct for this power transfer function. But as you start getting up into the eight, sixteen, thirty two, or sixty four bit cases, uh, that that this range uh, is is nearly unity for long enough that you can more or less ignore uh, the Van Vleck corrections. Now there's really just one last thing I wanted to talk about uh, in this lecture, and that is rounding. Uh, for the most part, rounding is very nearly the same thing as quantization. In fact, it's just uh, increasing the quantization. It's making your signal more quantized. If you start with an 8-bit quantization, for example, uh, and you want to round down to 4 bits, uh, you know, there are various ways you can do that, but fundamentally, uh, you're going from having 256 states to represent your signal down to just having 16 states. And so, uh, in some sense, uh, all, the, all the problems associated with that we've already discussed in quantization, that uh, you will have to worry about the power transfer, uh, you'll need to look at um, your signal levels and make sure you're toggling your bits, you're going to lose some dynamic range. Those are all uh, problems we've discussed already. Uh, the only last thing I want to discuss is exactly how you choose uh, to round a, a, a larger quantized number down to a smaller number of bits. So let me first write down a, uh, an 8-bit number here, and I'm just going to make up some 1s and zeros. And I've written it vertically just so I can show how we're going to take that 8-bit number and select out uh, four output bits uh, to send out. Now the assumption here is there are uh, 8 bits, and we're going to essentially be taking the top four bits to move over into the four-bit quantization. Now, why did I pick the, the top four bits and not, say, the bottom four bits? Well, if I take the, the bottom four bits, if I took these, then any information that's sitting in the top uh, bits here uh, is thrown out. Now, if I weren't using these, if these were all zeros, then what's going to happen here is my signal was essentially a 4-bit signal anyway. I wasn't using the full dynamic range of my 8 bits, and therefore I can actually, without loss, take the bottom 4 bits and output them. And then in that case, I haven't really requantized my, my uh, signal. I've just uh, chosen to, carry, uh, to not carry useless information along with it. Uh, so the, the case that's much more... Uh, oh, and I, I should mention, if you didn't, uh, if you did have information in the upper bits there and you throw them out, then uh, what you've essentially done to your number is you've divided it by some, uh, some large power of 2. You, you've you've uh, removed all of the large information and you just re retain the small wiggles on top of it. And so uh, that, in almost all cases I can think of, uh, mangles your si your signal to such an extent that it's irrecoverable. So you, you basically never want to do that. So if I'm taking the highest four bits, I, I've got a few choices. One is I can just uh, copy those, those bits across. So this is uh, case one. So in this case, I've chosen to throw out the information uh, that is below the top four bits. I've truncated this. Um, then what I essentially I've always done is I've subtracted a small uh, number off of my 8-bit uh, my number uh, to get my 4-bit number. So another way of saying that is I've taken a floor uh, of my number to the nearest uh, appropriate value. So this is truncation. Uh, truncation is, is, is essentially um, a floor function. 
And one of the disadvantages of rounding option one, this truncation, is that, uh, is that you've essentially uh, changed the center of your signal. That uh, you may have had a, a signal that was centered around zero, and by doing truncation, you introduce a, a, a DC bias. You, it will, the entire uh, signal will be skewed uh, towards the negative. And if you care about where the signal is centered, that can be a problem. Um, so that is one of the reasons why truncation is not favored. It systematically uh, skews your signal. So a second option that you might address that uh, skew, the DC bias problem, is to uh, round positive and negative numbers in opposite directions. That is to say, uh, we can go ahead and, uh, and choose to round our, our positive numbers uh, in one direction, either towards zero or towards infinity, um, and choose to uh, round our uh, negative numbers either towards zero or towards negative infinity. So option two, it kind of has two bra branches. There is round towards zero, and there's round towards infinity. Uh, so in this option, uh, you look. You basically just look at the the sign of the uh, of your number, and then if you choose to round towards zero, then if you are positive, you do a truncation, um, and if you are negative, uh, you instead of filling this uh, with zeros, um, you 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 add one to your signal. You do a floor and then increment it up once, and, um, and then the the reverse is round towards infinity. Uh, which reverses those cases. In the in the uh, in the case that this is a positive number, um, it does truncation and adds one. Uh, and if it's a negative number, uh, it just does truncation. For option two, there are basically two actions that you either do: you either uh, truncate or truncate and add one. Now, option two addressed one of the problems with, of option one, which was that option one introduced a, a net DC bias. And in option two, because you have symmetric rounding positive and negative, then the assumption is for zero centered signals uh, that you will have preserved the fact that the signal is, is centered at zero. Um, one of the disadvantages of option two is you've change the amplitude of your signal in a systematic way. If you've chosen to round towards zero, then you've systematically attenuated your signal slightly. Uh, and if you choose to round towards infinity, you've systematically uh, amplified your signal slightly. So the final option, option three, tries to address the problems with option two about maintaining a constant amplitude uh, through the rounding step. And basically, because you, you really can only choose to truncate or truncate and add one uh, for any particular uh, case of rounding, what you have to do is, is try to, to, to dither your choice of whether you round towards infinity or round towards zero. Um, and so to do that, uh, there are two uh, different ways to implement a, a third option, which is round towards even or round towards odd numbers. Now these cases are basically uh, just what they say. They say, um, look at the final four bits that will be output by your rounding step. And, uh, and you have on, on any uh, rounding, you have two choices of, of uh, what you can output here. You can either output the number that's below uh, the top four bits that, uh, that you see here, the 8-bit number, or the one that is the slide above, because this 8-bit uh, number falls in between two 4-bit states. So you only have two possible outputs that you can choose between. And, uh, and option 3 uh, says choose the one of those uh, output states that is either the even number or the odd number. You can choose either one. It doesn't make a huge difference. Uh, and the feature that that has is it, um, it still has the, uh, all the features of option 2 that you aren't introducing a net DC bias uh, to your signal, uh, but because it alternately is, is choosing to round up and around down, uh, it isn't on average changing the amplitude of your signal either. Um, so that is why option three, these round towards even or round towards odd uh, rounding schemes are the most preferred for signal fidelity.
on the other hand, uh, if you're trying to implement this logic, uh, this requires the most logic to implement because it has to check uh, for each state whether it's making it an even or an odd number. Um, whereas uh, option two was, was much simpler uh, in that it just needs to take care of a couple cases of, of positive and negative and whether you round towards zero or round towards infinity. And of course the simplest option logic-wise to implement was option one, which was to simply uh, throw away information. Uh, in, that, in that case, you, you're really only just taking the upper parts of the information. You're not actually changing any of the numbers or having to make any decisions. Uh, so these are the, the various options that are available to you. Option three is the best in terms of signal fidelity. Option one is the cheapest in terms of the logic to do it. Um, and, and so these are all uh, for your application uh, may be appropriate for different uh, things that you want to do.